In the 17 and 1800s, black pioneers settled communities in a number of places across Ontario. If that comes as a surprise to you, perhaps the story of one such village, Priceville, near Collingwood, helps explain why. With us now on that, we welcome in Harrow, Ontario, which is in Essex County, Elise Harding Davis, former curator at North American Black Historical Museum and Cultural Centre, which is now known as the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. And in Midtown of the provincial capital, there's producer and director Jennifer Holness, who's president of Hungry Eyes Media, which produced the film Speakers for the Dead. And it's all about the history of Priceville, Ontario. And it's great to have you two on our program tonight. I want to start by just setting up our conversation by showing a clip from Jennifer's National Film Board documentary. This is going back more than 20 years, Speakers for the Dead. And we want to start with a clip of Priceville resident Les McKinnon. Here we go. Sheldon, if you would. When I was in grade six, I had written a story about early pioneers in Gray County. And I told with some pride that Irish and Scottish settlers were the first non-native settlers in Gray County. It took me a good portion of the rest of my life up till now to realize that that, that was bogus, that it was a lie of a sort, but I took every available document, every book that I could find, and seemingly they all had this same, almost verbatim, that Irish and Scottish settlers were the first non-native settlers in Great County. But then stories were told to me about some of those early Scottish families that moved into Southern Grey, particularly around Priceville, and how some of them had written letters back home to relatives in Scotland and described the dark people that they met here when they arrived. Jennifer, I suspect that bit of news is going to come as a tremendous revelation to almost everybody watching this program right now. And th that's why we need your help in getting to the bottom of this, because your documentary shows that that fact has essentially, never mind has been forgotten, but has been virtually wiped out of our history books. Um, how did that happen? Well, definitely, it's an, it's a, it's a issue of erasure. And so, essentially, Priceville was a small town. It was, um, it was actually uh, um, founded by Colonel Price, who was a black man and a loyalist soldier. And he brought a group of blacks who settled that land. They built a, a schoolhouse. They built a church. They had a cemetery. And they, though, were um, in Canada, they were the first non-Indigenous settlers in that area, as in many places in southwestern Ontario. And um, essentially what happened is Canada became a country, and Irish and Scottish, Scottish settlers uh, were invited in. And uh, although the black folks who lived there and had this community had cleared the land and had been there for a good 20, 30 years, their land was given to the white settlers. And so... That meant that they had to leave. And so there was violence in some cases where they were forced out of those communities and Priceville was essentially taken away from them. And so they went off into places like Owen Sound. And so that history, though, has been slowly eradicated. Um, and, and another part of the history is that um, when people think of um, black folks, they always think of people that look like myself, so darker skinned, especially when they think of slaves, um, you know, uh, enslaved people. They think of darker skinned people. And in actual fact, uh, some of these uh, black folks were very light skinned, which is how they actually managed to even get to Canada. And, um, and so there was a situation where some of these folks actually intermarried into the white community. And that, that, that uh, genetics was something that people didn't want, want to talk about. They, and so there was a number of reasons why that black history has been essentially eradicated from the history books, so that by the time the 50s rolled around, almost no one even knew Colonel Price was a black man. Yeah, Lise, could you pick up the story here? Because this is not the only place in the province of Ontario where the black presence has essentially been written out of our history books. How does that happen? Well, it happens in several ways. When people buy property, they have deeds. Um, we 
black people uh, are always depicted as squatters. That's because we weren't necessarily told that we had to have deeds. Uh, when we were enslaved, we weren't allowed to legally read and write. We didn't know all of the social norms and ways of having property. And so um, we found ourselves having settled, cleared, built homes, and put in crops. And then the Irish and other European settlers came along and knew about getting deeds and things like that. And that's how we lost property. That's an interesting double standard, isn't it? Squatters yes, versus settlers. If, Thank you. Yeah. If, if you're if you're Irish or Scottish, you were a settler. If you were black, you were a squatter. Correct. See, Absolutely. And I fought diligently to um, equalize language. That is to say, the history of black people, we use words towards them like fugitives. That means someone running from crimes they committed. We were refugees. We were running from crimes committed against us. And normalizing language will certainly help in allowing people to better understand the Black experience. Hmm. Jennifer, as I pointed out earlier, your documentary came out more than 20 years ago. And I wonder if you could um, remind us how it was received when it first came out. So, so here's the thing. The documentary came out um, about 20 years ago. It was our first film. Actually, I, I, I co-directed this film with my partner, Sud Sutherland, and it was our first film. And um, it, was, it was really interesting. Um, we believe that we brought to the Canadian story um, elements that people just didn't know. And, but there was not that big of interest. For example, we didn't get into hot dogs. Um, CBC did pick up the, 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 the film, um, but there was almost no press around it. Interestingly enough, in the U.S., we had, um, we had ma uh, major networks contact us about the film, and, um, and we've actually had quite a bit of um, Black Americans uh, that have, have uh, reached out about it. In fact, uh, most recently, about two years ago, Suds, um, my co-director, and I were invited to Harvard um, by the uh, Canadian chair at Harvard uh, because uh, she uses our film. She's a professor, and she uses her film all the time in her in her lectures. And we were invited to Harvard to give a talk about Black Canadian history. But as uh, as for the Canadian side of it, it it really hasn't been given the I guess the the support or the weight that that of of the story because here it is. Um, Black folks have had a real impact in the creation of this country. And I, myself, I'm an immigrant. I came to Canada when I was very young, when I was five or six years old. And, um, but I was taught in school almost entirely um, a history that had no Black people in it. And when it did, it was Black American history, right? Hmm. So we have a problem in this country where we don't know the significant amount of Black history there is here. Can I just uh, hang on? I got I got to follow up on that. You got invited to go to Harvard to give a presentation about your film, but no post-secondary institution in the province of Ontario gave you an invitation. Um, not in Ontario, actually. To be <laughs> truthful, um, uh, um, the the um, the Harvard chair is Canadian, so it's a Canadian chair uh, of Harvard. So she actually is a she's a she was a professor out of Montreal who uses our film on a regular basis. But we have actually never been invited by anybody in Ontario <laughs> uh, uh, to screen the film in a university capacity. Well, you're laughing about it, but I presume those laughs are are covering up tears. I mean, that's that's kind of outrageous, isn't it? Um, if you're a black person in Canada, look, you are. <laughs> this is just how it works. Now, here here's the thing. Remember a few months ago when um, George Floyd was murdered, um, and and all of the um, social justice cries echoed all over the world. Um, we had politicians saying that we did not have this problem in Canada because we didn't have slaves. We had, we had people saying that black folks are so much better off here that we don't have those crime problems. Yet Scott Worthley, 
uh, a professor at U of T did a study with the police that came out maybe about six six weeks or two six weeks ago that essentially said black folks were 20 times more likely to be killed by the police in Canada. So we have politicians who have zero idea about the black history in this country, right? So that's that's surprising, you know, the you know, the fact that the film hasn't been given I, I think the weight that it's it's due. So this is an opportunity for all of us to learn. I think so, you know. Um and I'm not saying by the way that the film has not had impact. You know, uh for one thing, in the Priceville community, it's actually, I believe, it's helped change that community, that Owen Sound community. I was talking to, uh, well, both Elise, actually, and um, other scholars like um, Carolyn Smarts, and they said that in those communities, this film is shared and and um, and really well-loved, and everyone acknowledges the history that it presents. In addition to that, um, the, um, a, a monument had been created for the four um, uh, stones that had been found in a in a stone pile. Uh, these are the gravestones that had been found in a, in a stone pile. A monument had been created, and it, and it became quite dilapidated. And in 2013 to 2016, um, funding was given to create a wonderful structure to preserve those gravestones. And I believe that this film and the, the bringing this story to light had something to do with that. I see. Uh, at least let's get you back in here. How many generations, we know a, a bit now about Jennifer's background, so let's find out about yours. For how many generations have you and yours been in Canada? Black side of my family has been in Canada since 1798. I am a seventh generation Canadian. Um, okay, my reaction to that is, wow. I, I, don't know, <laughs> I, I don't know too many white folks who go back that far. No, I don't either. <laughs> Where did your people come from? Well, uh, some came from uh, Virginia. Some come, came from Maryland. Um, the last branch of the family that came in the late 1840s came from Missouri. And why do you think that we know so little about Colonel Price, the United Empire loyalist, who, after whom Priceville was named? Because he was a black United Empire loyalist. And largely, by 1811, the names of Black United Empire loyalists were largely stricken from the rolls. Um, we have to put ourselves into the mindset of the time. This was still when slavery was legal on the entire North American continent. Colonel Price and many people like him who came to Ontario had made the decision to fight for Great Britain, which made them loyalists. And the land grants that they got were in areas that uh, the white loyalists didn't necessarily want because it was too hard to clean or drain or uh, cut down the forest. We were more than willing to take that. We had worked under similar conditions under enslavement, and that didn't bother us. But again, I'm saying we weren't given socialized information on how to own something, just taking it over and clearing it up and promising to meet guidelines and stipulations like clearing five acres within three years or paying off the price of the property within 10 years. Um, little tricks were played hmm. and the property was taken away. Uh, Elisa, I wonder if I could follow up with this. Again, I want you to take us back. The black community had established itself in Priceville and then white settlers came into the area. And I wonder if you could just give us some more information about that first contact, how it all went. Well, there would be several ways in which it would go. Um, the black families most probably invited the white families into their homes until they could get their own properties cleared and built. Um, 
the white settlers may have been a little bit jealous of what they were seeing. You know, after all, European immigrants were coming from hard times as well. The Irish came here with the first potato famine. Um, they were under colonization from the British. They had very little themselves. And to see others who were racially sub not appreciated. Uh, I'm trying to be very diplomatic about the way I say this. I noticed things. that. That was a very gentle way of putting it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there could have been, as Jennifer said, mixed marriages. And so over the course of even two generations, we can blend out. And people wouldn't know that we were Black unless they were told. And so in order to not be ashamed of themselves or to take on the guise of a white person, they would shun their Black family. Jennifer, was it also the case that if you were a white family and you worked the land for the year, it was yours? If you were a Black family, not the case. Is that true? Absolutely. In, in actual fact, um, some of the, the settlers, the white settlers, targeted land that had, uh, that had already been cleared, that there weren't any deeds. And so, and so, and within a year, <laughs> uh, because they, they, they had land that had actually been prepared for them, uh, essentially, they were able to move in and establish, you know, the community. And, um, and so, and as you know, with, with, with Priceville, after uh, you know, whites took over the community. Um, the only remnants was the cemetery, and what actually happened was a farmer, um, Billy Reed, plucked all these the uh, gravestones and um, essentially pitched some of them into a stone pile, floored his uh, stable and the and his basement with the with the um, the gravestones, and of course um, one one gentleman, Stuart Muir, who was an older gentleman in the film, he talked about them using uh, a gravestone as home plate. So, you know, there was no respect for, for uh, the, the Black lives that, that, you know, was there before, the Black's lives that, um, that had done all of this work. Um, you know, uh, there was no value placed on them. And so, you know, it, it is the part of the history. And, and here's the thing, at every turn, White loyalists, white folks have been given the means to succeed, um, okay. whether it be access to homes, grants, um, uh, land grants, even loans, things that were denied black folks. So every, you know, so make no mistake in Canada at every, everything that happened in the U S except perhaps the, the, um, uh, aggressive violence, all of those same things happened here. Hmm. And one of the things that Helen Miller says is that it was the same. It was the same, but we didn't have the signs. Elise, I guess if you really want to erase history, one of the best ways to do it is just get rid of the cemeteries because they are wonderful repositories of historical record. How, how, how widespread was that practice in this province all those years ago? Province-wide, hmm. uh, you were talking about uh, the markers being taken off by Mr. Reed. When I was at the museum, I had a similar instance where a gentleman came with uh, several broken pieces of markers in the back of his truck, and he asked, does this place want to take these, or uh, I'm going to go throw them in the dump? And he, too, raised potatoes on the property. We kept the markers and made a memorial cemetery at the back of the museum. Hmm. And as for uh, being better than the United States, we had violence here too. Hmm. As late as uh, 1955, a gentleman was killed in the Collingwood area because his co-workers were jealous of the fact that he had been made a supervisor he was a veteran of the Second World War. And on a particular day, they wanted to see a monkey swing. The one worker took his foot off the brake. 
and the gentleman was killed. And nothing has ever been done about it. Jennifer, you told us earlier that you were a young kid when you came to Canada. And I wonder how much, how much uh, knowledge or history of the black experience uh, in this country did you learn when you first got here? <laughs> um, none. Um, you know, Steve, I have to say that I'm a filmmaker because of the lack of information. I grew up. I love. I, I love being Canadian, and I and I. I have. You know, I'm married. I have three kids, and it's like my roots here. I love also my Jamaican heritage. But here's the thing. I learned almost nothing, and I felt like I did not belong in this country for a very long time because there was nothing. When you don't see yourself um, or when you don't hear, the, the, when there's just nothing there, you, you, there is a, there's a longing and a lack. And so I have always been a storyteller from a, from a young child. And, um, and so part of the reasons I became a filmmaker was because I wanted to tell these stories because I was, I, cause I, I remember the hurt of feeling like I didn't belong, of feeling like, you know, there was nothing that grounded us into this place. So, um, yeah, there was almost nothing. Uh, there was some American history for the most part, actually, mm -hmm. that, uh, it was black stories. Um, and it was so grounded in say slavery and the context was certainly not, um, you know, slavery was bad, but that was literally the start and the end of it. Um, and as you know, um, you know, you, you felt um, you were left to feel um, embarrassed by it. Well, let's look a little bit more of your work, shall we? <laughs> let's do that. Sheldon, if you would, the next clip from her documentary. Priceville is not mentioned. The settlers of the old Durham Road are not mentioned in the general, the very few books on general black history in Canada. There is a overriding conspiracy, a non-conspiracy maybe, of silence in the community where people just don't talk about it. And that's the way they were trained. Don't talk. If you don't say it, it doesn't exist. And a lot of them were hushed up when they were kids. And for me, I've been difficult to shut up all my life. There's Les McKinnon again. Jennifer, have you been heartened by the fact that uh, there are white people in Priceville who are championing your cause now? Oh, absolutely. Listen, this came together because um, black descendants had actually, for decades, had been looking for their ancestors and they were lied to and it was never told to them and at some point in the 80s guys like Les McKinnon uh, um, you know um, and some I was thinking of some of the other folks on the, the committee Clausine catcher the catchers um, Chris and Clausine um, uh, folks like that they formed a committee and this happened in the late 80s and um, and they formed this committee uh, with the black folks, and it was essentially about uh, reclaiming this history. And look, at the end of the day, right, I, I really think that we can't, we can't actually do this work alone, uh, this, I, this idea that we must be allies in the reclaiming of these stories is something I'm completely and um, absolutely invested in, you know? Mind you, it actually should have the black folks leading the charge, but there, there needs to be allies in, this, uh, in the reclaiming of this history. Well, let's find out from Elise. Do you see that happening enough? Is this veil of silence over the black involvement in the province's history? Is it finally lifting? Yes, it is. Uh, very slowly and very painfully. <laughs> um, I can say chapter and verse repeating what Jennifer has said. Uh, with the exception of the fact that when I was in school and slavery was mentioned, it was a matter of fact thing uh, that happened and we were happy about it because after all, we had been rescued from Africa, uh, a place where we were savages. Um, it was very hurtful hmm. and it was very angering. And I in my own way, have worked on presenting and preserving black history 
since I was a child. Um, I've been very fortunate to meet people like Jennifer. Uh, we are of a like mind. Um, you know, there are good white people and there are good black people, but good white people are listened to first because of systemic thinking. The traditional thought and the prejudging, which is the prejudice that happens right here in Canada, that we're less educated, we're less knowledgeable, um, our word is not as sacred as others. And uh, there have been many legislations against us. Black people were not invited to become Canadian citizens until 1911, Steve. Um, you know, I really want to ask you how you've managed, and I'll use your word from earlier, you've managed to keep your diplomatic demeanor in spite of clearly the, the hurt and the pain that you feel deep down over the years. How have you done that? I've managed to separate myself from it. I've been uh, severely hurt and angered by things people have said and done um, about the whole history itself. You know, the claiming of uh, things that we have done, the taking of our property, desecration of our graves. Uh, at one town close to me that uh, during their fair, they used the grave site for overflow parking. That's one of the reasons I got the award that I was telling you about a little earlier in preservation. I've helped to preserve 13 black cemeteries in Essex County and several across the country because people have connected with me. Um, I've become authority on some of these things and that's how I've kept my anger down. And that's also what's kept me seeking knowledge and uplifting black thread in the Canadian tapestry. That's wonderful. And congratulations on getting that award. It is so well deserved. And I should say as well that the Canadian Media Producers Association have given an award uh, to the other person on this program. <laughs> and Jennifer, congratulations to you for getting that award. Uh, again, long overdue and, uh, and highly deserved. I wonder though, Jennifer, whether you think it's possible if we're talking about recreating history and, and making sure it has its place in our society today, can any of these cemeteries that have been obliterated across Ontario, can they be recreated? You know, that's that's a that's a bigger question, and I think Elise might actually uh, be the better person to, to answer that because that's a specific work she does. But I think what it is is this. It's the stories of the people. It is their presence that has to be uh, honoured. You know, the film is called Speakers for the Dead because I was so aware that th no one was talking for them. No one was rep representing them. No one was advocating for them. You know, and for many of our experiences in, on these shores, that's been the history. So, um, so I'm not entirely sure how one would sort of reclaim those spaces, um, but I know that the history, their presence, um, their stories is what we must reclaim and we must put this in our history books and we must change how we see um, these places uh, and these spaces. Elise, you want the last word on that? Can these grave sites be reclaimed and restored? Yes, they can. Uh, researching, uh, going through the registry and uh, finding the documentation, it's there. It just has to be ferreted out and then presented. And we have been working diligently, numerous of us, to present and preserve our history. It's just that we needed people like Jennifer to come along with her hungry eyes <laughs> and give us the opportunity to be on a, a larger platform. And appearing on a show like yours, Steve, is wonderful because it helps people to understand we are pioneers of this country. We helped to build this country. We were freedom fighters right here. And we have developed this country to a place where we can finally be on a television show 
that will help us put our trumpets out there and help people to understand that without black history, history is incomplete. Can I get an amen on that? Okay, I got... <laughs> amen. amen. <laughs> <laughs> I got some clapping hands from Jennifer, so we'll go for that too. Uh, Elise Harding Davis, Jennifer Holness, it's really great of both of you to honor us by appearing on our program, and we wish you continued success with the important work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.